Hello, you hardcore boxing fans out there. How are you doing? It's Russ here from Porky's Corner, the biggest gov in sport. Today we're joined by my good friend Julian from Jewsbury, former trainer to British champion Gary Sykes. How are you doing, Julian? I'm good, mate. I'm good. Uh, just back off the holidays in the middle of the night. Uh, come back to do all the washing, all the exciting stuff, but feeling rested, feeling good after 10 days in the sun, mate. Brilliant. Uh, well, there's a lot going on with the sport of boxing. I don't really know where to start, uh, so we'll just go balls deep, shall we? Anthony Joshua, uh, Robert Hilarious, what did you make of it all? And the hula, well, hooping and balar, whatever, around it all. I thought Joshua would win that fight quicker, as I'd said before. I did predict a highlight real KO because when you get an upright... 39-year-old who's way past his best, but was never that great to start with. And he's typical of fighters who, tall fighters have a, often make the mistake of when they're walking towards the ropes, they yeah. straighten up. It's just something that they do. And that let, has left him exposed several times in his career. Um, I, I was concerned about the marking of AJ, you look, fighters get hit, you get hit by a big guy who's 18, 19 stone, you're going to suffer some damage. I understand that. But it reminded me a little bit of, because I don't know if anyone's confirmed anything, but the nose looked broke to me, the way he was pushing the corner man away um, when he was dabbing his nose with the towel. He obviously was in Is some pain. Is that a natural reaction what fighters do, Julian? Yeah, it's painful. It depends on the type of break, where it is, and what part of the, what part of the nose it is. But he really didn't react well to that. And what that told me was, if you think about it, Hellenius landed several jabs, but he didn't throw that much. Yeah. And AJ got marked up. He got small welts under both eyes. He got the nose probably broken or fractured from just a few shots that got through. You know, anything that Hellenius threw, got through. And it reminded me of Kel Brook. You know, when I said to him, fighters get older. They also start to mark up easier and they, yeah. they get more damage. You look at Kelbrook with the orbital bones and things such as that. Yeah. And I thought, if that's the damage that he's getting, literally against an old guy who's pinged him a few times with one or two swiping jabs and screw jabs, what kind of damage is he going to get? You know, I'm not just talking about getting knocked out. I'm on about facial damage. What kind of damage, damage is he going to get? when he gets a, a Fury or a Wilder or even a Zang or somebody like that in front of him. So that for me was a real worry. Um, and I think I mentioned this when we did the previous video. I understand coaches' work takes time, but where was this defence? He's been heavily critical of Rob McCracken. Where was this defence that he's worked with on Garcia and Derek James? He's spent a lot of time in American gyms with you know coaches who are quite well known for their defensive strategy. Where was the slip? Where was the block? Where was the dip? Where was the push in, the push off, the pivot off, the step under? Where was all this stuff? Do you know something? Final one, I know I'm running out of breath. When I used to do a class at Central Boxing Club, it used to pay the rent for Dickie's gym. It used to pay the rent for the back room. I did two weekly classes. And what I used to do was I used to, you know, we'd train the people, but these were non-boxers. And we'd do between 16 and 18 defences of the jab. You know, you can, some coaches teach a bit less, but there's between 16 and 18 ways to defend a jab. And I didn't see one from Anthony Joshua. And that is really worrying. Yeah. Uh, you know, if you were to put him in with these guys, I just want you to give me give me a bit. Would he beat these, these guys I'm going to tell you about now? Wilder. I say no now. I, I was fence sitting on that one, but absolutely not. Right, a third one with Usyk. Probably, I could see the third fight him getting stopped. Usyk's been inactive, though. I just think there's something about AJ now, the fragility, the confidence, the lack of defence, the lack of not knowing what, what am I? Am I, a, am I a boxer? Am I this killer? Which you know, No chance. He'd never beat Usyk in a million Sundays. Tyson Fury. Uh, I genuinely believe, I've been criticised for saying this before, I genuinely believe Tyson Fury could beat him with one hand. If you just give him his left hand, I think he could jab him and hook him from an orthodox stance. 
If you switch southpaw with a left uppercut, the left cross, I genuinely believe Tyson Fury could beat Anthony Joshua with one hand, genuinely. Do you think Tyson would do that, just to prove a point? I do. I think he, I think he could do. I've seen fighters do certain things like that in the gym or in the ring just to boss somebody to let you know yeah. that I can do whatever I want with you. Fury could... He could brutalise him in three rounds if he decided to push him back like he did Wilder the first and second yeah. fight. He could ping him something silly if he did like he did against Klitschko and just spar him and yeah. just make a mug of it. Or he, he, he could do anything he wanted to. He genuinely could do anything he wanted to, AJ. All right, then. What about uh, Zhang? I think the Zhang that beat Joyce, he's 39, remember, and we know AJ 40, likes 39 years old. He's 40, yeah. It might be, mate, but is I think Zhang, the Zhang that beat Joyce and Zhang, who's relatively active, is a bit too strong and a bit too sharp for AJ. And even though Usyk's way better than Zhang, from a skill set point of view, you've got 20 stone on the end of that southpaw cross as opposed to 16 stone. Big difference. And I think I think Zhang would make a mess of him. And we know Joe, Zhang's durable as well. Yeah, Joe Joyce? No, I think AJ would beat Joe Joyce. I think Joe Joyce is... Pretty poor. Uh, Dubois? No, I think Dubois is dire. You know I do. When I say dire, sorry. Apologies, Danny Dubois. I think you are really nowhere near a world-class fighter. Not yet. Never. Never. Oh, right. Never. So I've got a chance against Usyk then, no? No. I mean, I think if Usyk's grown old overnight, he still would just know enough to... To get through. To win that fight quite easily. Yeah. Um, sorry having, having the power, but you've got a bit of land that power and you don't learn that in six months in the gym. You learn that through a career of demonstrating that you, you can adapt to different styles and he hasn't shown that. What about Yui Fury, age 28, 29 against Joshua? I'm going to reserve judgment on that one because I think the best version of AJ would beat the best version of Yui. I'm always honest with you about that. I want to see Huey Fury, what he looks like after his 12 months out of the ring, because we know that um, Peter's made some claims that he's looking stronger and he's looking more grounded and, and he's put a little bit of weight on. I'd want to see Huey Fury in action in a decent test before I made a decision about that one. OK. Uh, what about Moses, Moses Atome? Do you think he's not ready yet? I'll tell you what about Moses Atome, because speed and skill is um, it, it's everything. But obviously, you need to become grounded and rounded and, and build up to the sort of championship rounds. I'd put money on Moses um, over four rounds beating Joshua. And I would also say if they did a six-round spa, he'd make AJ look absolutely ridiculous. That, I'm not going to say who told me that, but uh, a world champion, a former world champion, and it won't Carl Froch, but a former world champion said to me, exactly what you, you just said to me there, he's a world right, okay. six-round fighter at the moment, and he would tear Joshua apart in a six-round of sparring or in a fight. And he says in two years, Joshua, had been just, he'd just smash him to pieces in a, in a ten-round fight. Absolutely, and people don't understand that because... You know, what I'd like to know is, I mean, what is Moses? Is he is he 19 yet? He's a baby, isn't he? Yeah. So this is what we hear about AJ. AJ is 34 in October and he's a working pro. So yeah. why is AJ demonstrating after all those amateur fights and after all those professional fights and world title fights, he's not demonstrating even 20% of the skill set that Moses is demonstrating. For anybody who jumps on me straight away and says he hasn't beaten anybody, He's a work in progress. There's no guarantee he's going to be a world champion. But what yeah. you have to look at is the skill set. You have to look at the way he reacts, the way he uses his space, the way he sets his shots up. He's a baby, but he's doing things that AJ has never, ever done and never demonstrated in his career. Moses Atuma is doing. He's got brilliant balance. He's got a really nice wide feet. But Glides wide across the ring, doesn't it? Off. Glides, doesn't it? He's ex exactly, and that was my point. Some fighters have two, two of a wide stance that it makes them vulnerable to be able to, to step in and step out. I'm excited about different. him, me. I'm excited about him. He's it. very good. I, I saw, when I heard the, the news that Warren had signed him, I thought, all right, okay, you should have done your homework, Jules, have a look at him. And I watched, bear in mind, he only had a very limited amateur career. I watched three of his amateur fights back to back. 
an earlier one, a middle one, and kind of a more later one. Absolutely amazing skill sets, brilliant skill sets. Okay, Jared Anderson against Joshua now. People are going to say that Anderson struggled last time out. I think Anderson would be AJ. I think he'd throw too many punches. He'd be, he'd be too young for him. He'd be fearless and he'd adapt. And so what? He had a tough turnaround and that's part of boxing. That doesn't mean to say, you know, just because you have a tough turnaround that you can't go out and beat somebody else. I think Anderson beats Joshua and that's irrespective of Anderson ever be, fulfills his potential or not. I think he beats Joshua because there's something about a young buck who's fearless, who throws shots, who's got power in both hands, but not just both hands, but both stances. He can throw a right uppercut from an orthodox stance. He can throw a right uppercut from a southpaw stance. And that's quite a difficult thing to do. So he's got too many tools in the set for Anthony Joshua. Okay. Uh, you saw the performance against Robert Hilarious. We, we all saw what happened. What did you make of it all afterwards? You know, the 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 jumping out the ring and Conor McGregor being the only person in the arena who were allowed to take uh, alcohol in there because basically I'm told he told the security to F off. And he's, Joshua's drinking Guinness at the side of the ring with all snot and blood and all that. And what, what did you make of all that? Well, so much for strict liability about controlling what goes in your mouth, although... McGregor did kind of the first time he thrust it in front of his face, didn't he? But I thought it was, I thought it was embarrassing. Um, you probably needed Conor McGregor at that fight, no matter how cringeworthy some of that stuff was, because he's a massive star, and there wasn't a lot else going on, was there? We didn't get the grud the grudge match, the rematch with Dillian White. I wasn't that bothered about that, but I'd have much preferred White to Hellenius. I just think. Jumping out the ring, all right. Fighters get excited. Sometimes you get a, you get a buzz, but this is the second time he's left a stricken fighter knocked out and jumped out of the ring. Now, if anybody else does that, it's branded as like really, really crass. And I'm going to give you an example, all right. And this is not just singling people out, but when Josh Warrington got knocked out by Lara in the first fight. His cornerman was so composed that just remember, just got a massive upset of the number one favorite in the world. They were like nowhere at that time. His cornerman celebrated very quietly outside of the ring and they showed real professionalism and real respect to a guy who was, Warrington was hurt, he was stricken that night, he was badly, badly knocked out. And then if you look at Lee Wood when he knocked out Conlon and we had uh, Barry. And it was Ben Davison jumping and carrying on and going crazy when you've got a guy who's been knocked out of the ring who's in a bad way. And it actually ended up being Lee Wood who was the one who was quieting his coaches down to stop the celebration. I think it's easy to get eaten up in the moment, but there's something after three or four seconds you switch in and say, that guy's hurt. We yeah. used to see Jack Dempsey, who was a role model of Mike Tyson, and Jack Dempsey used to knock guys down, knock them out, and pick them back up and help them up. And Tyson used to do that as well. Tyson would help people. But AJ is really, this isn't bash AJ, by the way. I, I kind of still quite like him. But AJ is not this beautiful ambassador of humanity that people think he is. And I think it just shows that he's almost got a petulance about him when he's victorious or when, he, when he's in defeat. He has to just do these things that are not very sportsmanlike. You think he's a bully, a flat track bully that's been oh, that match his match? Yeah, he's a met metaphorical bully because the, the Andrew Ruiz thing, I can never get out of my head. I've said this to you so many times. In the rematch never... when they were frightened. I think it was in the first fight in particular when the referee gave him the count and he was dying for that referee to stop that fight. Yeah. And he just, he has that look in his face, like the first Usyk fight when he sent to Romacock and uh, what do I throw next? What do I throw next? He is a, an archetypal, you know, is is the is the is the typical Archetype bully. Bullet. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah, it's been a long fight, mate. But he, he he really is, and he's one of those fighters. When things, I mean, there are fighters out there that happens to, but when things go their way, right, everything's great. But when things aren't going their way, um, it, they're, they're a different thing. But what I will mention about. Anthony Joshua's fragility, and this was goes back to what you just said. Jumping out of the ring 
and celebrating and losing the plot almost when you've just knocked out a 39-year-old who 18 months ago was almost decapitated by Deontay Wilder. The guy who's a few days now is, is an old man. If you are so excited about knocking him out, that just shows how low your confidence is because it's like, God, I so needed that knockout. I so needed that punch because I am so low. And, you know, generally you get you get big heavyweight stars who score knockouts like that. And it's like, yep, yeah, good shot, bread and butter. That's what I expected to do. But it was almost like huge relief for Joshua to um, to pull that shot out. And why are you relieved at the fact that you just wiped a guy out like that who was literally made to order? He was like a just eat. It was like a KFC. He was made to order. Um, and he took he can give you a lot more problems um, than you wanted. And what I will say finally on this one is... Anybody who thinks AJ needed the round so carried Hellenius is a first-class idiot because you don't carry people who are beating you up and who are busting your nose and breaking your nose and making you swallow your blood. So that's a stupid thing to say. Yeah. Uh, Tony Bellew said that he were carrying him and Andy Lee corrected him very swiftly and very curtly and Tony Bellew piped down. Did you notice that? Well, as you know, I was in a bar in Tenerife, so I couldn't quite hear. I heard bits, and then people were, you know, sort of up on the feet when he knocked him out. And then afterwards, the bar was busy, so I have. I need to probably sit down and watch watch some highlights of it. Whereas you know, I don't subscribe anymore to that channel. Um, but good on Andy Lee; he keeps it real. And Tony Bellew, I, I've always kind of liked Tony Bellew. I know you give me a bit of stick for that, but. He shouldn't be allowed to commentate on the zone because how can you commentate on one of your mates? Uh, it's just, I don't understand it. Um, and I thought that, you know, we used to call it the sky bias, didn't we? The sky bias, the sky matchroom bias. But that bias doesn't seem as bad now with sky. So it was clearly just the matchroom bias. Everything's set up in their favour from the commentary, from the officials appointed, from the journalists they allow to interview them. Everything is completely staged in their favour. Um, it's pretty crass, really. It's giving the public a false narrative so that if their guy loses and it's like a split decision, even though he could lose by five rounds, the public then scream for a rematch so it keeps matching down in at the top table where the food is, doesn't it? Yeah, and apparently everybody had a good night. I mean, we got... According to the guard. Well, we had some pretty one-sided sort of uh, fights early on. We'd got three really horrendous heavyweight fights, and we just got a decent punch by AJ in the in the seventh round, which was the only really good, solid moment of those last three fights. So, I thought it was a poor show. Um, what I will also say about AJ, and we've said it before, but this is his second stoppage now in what seven fights. Um, no, it's again, his third in nine. And they've all been so again, 40 year old. I'm just going to say they're all in the 40th year out there. And, and this is a a major problem. Is about Kim Poole, Old men. Um, old men. Pavetkin was the best of that group you've just mentioned. Former regular years champion. Ago. Yeah. Years and years ago, and obviously Klitschko schooled him. Years and years ago, he was a decent fighter, very good amateur pedigree. Um, but, a solid European guy, isn't he, Pavetkin? Pretty, pretty much so, and this is the problem, isn't it? Because you, that is it. Those are his. Pulev was, you know, the usual inactive, not not a great recent record, and it just becomes. There's a prescription, isn't there? There's a prescription to all of this, um, and it it was. Look, good for AJ, but it was just a bit sickly, and I thought what was interesting was. I've tried to watch a couple of bits um, while I was at the airport. I had a bit of downtime. Um, Eddie Hearn made a very interesting comment. And he, he said, the best case scenario, Anthony Joshua was the third best heavyweight in the world. And the worst case scenario is the fifth best heavyweight in the world. And that's as humble a comment as I've ever heard from Eddie Hearn. I mean, you and I might rank him a little bit lower based on what I've just said with the predictions earlier. But... 
he's conceding. So if you're saying best case and worst case, what he's actually saying is my bias tells me he's the third best, but realistically he's probably the fifth best. So right now he's got the fifth best everywhere in the world right now, and that might not feel too great. Who's your who's your top heavyweights from one downwards? I have to go with Tyson Fury as the number one heavyweight. I make comments about his behaviour and several things, but I have Fury as number one. I have Usek as a very, very close number two. I want to put Wilder in at number three, but I just wish he was more active instead of just looking for these big paydays. Number four, I think you'd have to have Zhang in at number four, just based on that win over Joyce. He's unfashionable though, Zhang, isn't he? He is, and you could say, well, why isn't Hergovic over Zhang? But Hergovic was terrible last week. Zhang, I thought, quite unlucky, but yeah. It's pretty dire after that, isn't it? It's, it's not great. I think you've got, as we've said, you've got the... Um, a couple of decent kids coming through on the periphery of the top 10. We've got really poor sort of middle ground in that top 10, like the likes of uh, Dillian White might still be rattling around at, you know, seven or eight or nine. Andy Ruiz is a good fighter on his day, but he's slightly overrated his Ruiz in that people always say, oh, he's this and he's that. But Ruiz really doesn't have a great CV, if you look at that through a, through a lens. Um, I think we've got, I think we've got the two top two heavyweights in the world, and then we've got some real space between everybody else. And people might think that's not quite right. People might think that Wilder would beat um, Usyk. Wilder wouldn't know what to do with Usyk. He wouldn't have a clue. We would not know what to do with him. We saw early on when Wilder was younger and fresher. There were some pretty average Polish guys who gave him gave him the rounds yeah. just because they had a little bit of ring craft. And Fury's got ring craft in the first fight and obviously the second and third fight. He, he's too much ring craft for Wilder. So what's Usyk going to do? Because whilst I think Fury's number one, I think Usyk skill wise is the best in, best on the planet, and I don't think there's any doubt about that. And I might have AJ. Yeah, I, I understand why it could be number five, but I still stick to my original point, which was, I think there are fighters out there like a like an Anderson who would beat him, but you have to rank him, I guess, on achievements, not just on who you think wins at any given time. Yeah, it's uh, okay. Uh, moving on then, uh, we're now over two hundred interviews in last. It's nearly two weeks in it on Monday. Uh, well, it's not too weak. We're now over 200 interviews from Spotty Frank and Eddie Hills. Are they trying to drown everybody out? Because they keep doing sit downs with just about anybody that will listen, don't they? They're doing 10, 12 interviews each a day. That's 25 a day going out. And they're building up a bit of a tally now, aren't they, to squash boxing because they're only giving select same people the interviews. But I've noticed it last four days. They're giving people who are just starting out on YouTube with a thousand subscribers and eight hundred subscribers. Not that's not thousand. That's not a, under a thousand. They're giving these people time, whereas before they wouldn't give them the airtime, would they? What? What? Why are they doing this? Because there's a very, very clear understanding. Some of these YouTubers now listen. You want to get on in boxing. You want a press pass. You better be nice to match room. You be careful what you ask me. Because if you ask me the wrong thing, you're out. And I said to you, didn't I? I said, unfortunately, with this Conor Ben thing, I, I kind of called it all the way through. That's not being arrogant. That people are trying to say... Or pompous. Or pompous. Or pompous, Julian, of no money. But people are trying to say, um, you know, do you know what? this? I always talk about the Conor Ben thing. This Conor Ben situation, it's like, it's really confusing. It's really complex. Well, guess what? It's not confusing and it's not complex. And I called it, must be almost a year ago now, everything was going to happen roughly. Right. So what they're doing now is classic public relations, right? Get as many interviews as you can on as many streams as you can. Avoid the controversial one because from my understanding, you haven't been given an interview with Eddie Hearn. Oh, um, and I'll put billboards up all over. 
yeah, Ultra Tech and other guys like that, and the Hat Man, the, these guys won't be given um, any interviews with Eddie Hearn. So what they're doing, it's very, very strategic. Eddie Hearn and Frank Smith are very media savvy, of course. I mean, Eddie's from a marketing background in his early career. But what they will have done is they will have, just like when a prime minister goes on question time or goes on a debate with his opposition, they get briefed by their own teams and they get think tanks in there and they get asked every single possible question you can ask. And so they have either a political answer for that one or they shut it down really quickly and move on. But they know exactly what they're doing. So these guys now are kind of put out this blanket response on the Conor Ben situation. But not one person, not one person is asking the right questions. I thought Simon Jordan in his first time when he sat down with Eddie, I thought it was poor. No one's asking the right questions. And the only question I want to know on this situation, you won't hear it, is are, are we saying now that there are no traces of clomiphene in the samples collected? Is that what we're saying? Yeah. Because no, no one's asked that. Because when you say he's been cleared, and I can't help going on about this one, he's been cleared by UCAD. First of all, he hasn't. He hasn't been cleared by the Board of Control. And as I said to you a week or two ago, if he'd been cleared by UCAD, then... <laughs> Why, had, why did they have a 21 days or 30 days to appeal? So it hasn't been cleared. They don't agree with the um, UK anti-doping panel. The independent body's response they don't agree with that. He's been cleared of nothing. Not one person has asked, was there clomiphene in his system? That seems to have just kind of gone away. Now, the 270-page document disappeared. I'd ask the question and say, does the 270-page document stand now? because that's been dismissed by the WBC, and that was presented to UCAD, who then followed that with a provisional suspension. So the understanding is, is the first 270-page document that was presented, um, there was no strong evidence to refute what was in those, in those samples. You see where I'm going with this one? So the second line of defence, as we know, was the... Um, and no one's asking the right questions, just it frustrates me, but the second line of defence, as you know, was this new team, and they had two strands. The first strand was jurisdiction, OK? UCAD didn't have jurisdiction. It was Vardy who was doing the testing. It was part of the WBC anti-boxing programme. His licence might have expired with the Boxing Board of Control, etc., etc., etc. So the first line of defence was the jurisdiction, and the second line of defence was to do with his, um, his own system, his own biology in terms of he might have potentially had some contaminated eggs on a, on a training camp, blah, blah, blah. And the second, the, one of the other questions I would ask is, what, what is your line of defence? When you've gone and you've appealed and you've won this appeal by the Independent Commission, what is your line of defence? Was it jurisdiction or was it not? Was it the other? Was it? Have you argued that his biology is different to everybody else's? And if it is different to everybody else's, have you got a chain of custody? Have you got receipts to prove where he's perhaps got these eggs from so we can do some testing? So we all know, and I have no issues saying this, Russ. I know you always allow me to have a little speech on Conor Ben. There's no hate here from me towards Conor Ben, right? I severely dislike drugs cheats in contact sports, combat sports. I don't like drugs cheats in any sports, but in combat sports... I think it's one of the lowest things you can do. It's one of the absolute lowest. Tony Bellew you agrees with you, but he's defending Conor Ben and he's defended Dylan White over Rivers. But what it keeps going back, what are we saying about the first? Are they saying that there are no traces of clomiphene? Well, nobody's the mentioning this clomiphene. None of these YouTubers or media people are asking them questions about this clomiphene. They're saying, oh, good news about Conor Ben, he's cleared. I watched this Geordie kid interview, Eddie, and he was saying, oh, it's great news and all this, and he's just licking for the sake of licking in a press pass, isn't it? Cleared, and I, would, I, would, I know if you've allowed me to, to sort of rant a little bit, you always do, because you're a good pal, and you know oh, I'm you passionate want, about this. You know I'm passionate about this stuff, because, as you know, I trained a fighter whose world title shot was destroyed because of a drug cheat, so I, it's a personal thing for me, right? But what I want to what I want to do is I want to de defend you to some extent, and you haven't you didn't know I'm going to say this. And the guard said about a week or two ago he mentioned you, didn't he, in an yeah, interview? Yeah, yeah. 
And what the gad said, and he used a term which I find quite juvenile, but also quite offensive. He used the term, first of all, he got your name wrong. Now, what I will tell you, Gareth... He knows who I am, I've heard back. Right, so Gareth Ray Davis, first of all, you know exactly who Russell Hartley is, who Paul, who Paul is, and we know you know that, and you know you know it. So when you get someone's name wrong, what you're trying to do is reduce their significance, and you're trying to say, I don't really pay too much attention to it. You're glued to this, mate, and you know you are, and you know exactly what Russell's name is and what the channel is and what the channel's about. Who I used to work for, he knows a lot. He knows everything, mate. And the second thing that really annoyed me, and it's not often this stuff, I think about this, but this annoyed me. He called us haters. Yeah. You, people having a chance. They've got another camera. Haters, haters. Well, just Gareth A. Davis, let me tell you about haters, right? What you're looking at now, if you're watching, is the guy who's given over 30 years to boxing. I'm not a hater of boxing, mate. I'm a lover of boxing. And if we are such haters, if Porky's Corner is full of such haters, why are you calling all this stuff right? Because if you were just a hater, you'd be dismissive for the sake of it and you'd be wrong more often than not. Why are you calling all this right? Why was I a hater? I actually said Joshua wouldn't fight Dillian White. I actually said Fury wouldn't fight Usyk. I actually said what happened with Conor Ben. You said exactly the same. You've been calling stuff for seven years. How are you a hater if you're continually proven right? That doesn't make you a hater. That makes you a strong, staunch critic because you want to regulate boxing. You want boxing to be healthy. You want boxing to be as good as it can be. And you want boxing to be competitive and entertaining. So just because we don't go around rimming like you do, just to get access to the shows and to become this caricature that you become, just because we don't do that, pal, doesn't make us haters. And when you've spent as, as much time with young amateur boxers as I have, not pros, not about pros, young amateurs in clubs who are from tough backgrounds and tough homes and don't really have much else to fight than boxing, when you've given as much to boxing as I have, just be careful who you call haters, mate, because it's a, it's a juvenile expression you trying to trivialise it, but ultimately, if we're a hater, what are you? You're an out-and-out -out rimmer. Out-and-out -out rimmer, well said. Uh, where do you see it ending for this shower now? Because Boom Gardner's tested as well, and there's some, there's a lot of holes in the story about the test and, you know, how, how it's been delayed, and she got to fight, didn't she, three days later, and Blah, blah blah, it's all a bit of a mess, isn't it? Really, as soon as a finding comes up, and you know that finding is positive, and that person's going to take part in a contact sport, you you let those people know straight away. There's no admin clerical errors, there's no delays, you get onto it straight away. So it's more dirty cover ups, and I hate to do this. I, I told you so to everybody else, but Russell, we haven't rehearsed this, by the way. What did I say to you ages ago about Boom Gardner? You said to me, but Dripping Tap said it as well, and Terry Chappen yep. said Are you, that she were on the Nuts and Special Blender summer, or one, and you said that, didn't you? Yeah, uh, she's got more, she's, yeah, got, yeah. she's more testosterone in her body than a 17-year-old boy. She had peaks on a bicep like Mickey Theo, didn't she? Yeah. <laughs> and Mickey, Honestly, obviously, it's... Mickey were not Jill. She is one who nearly died because of it. Yeah, and I'm not suggesting um, that that all punchers, all female punchers, are on um, some kind of steroid because I don't believe that to be true. Power can be natural. But it's very rare that we see that kind of core strength and that right hand power that that boom guard has got, and just the core strength's really good, and she just holds the middle middle of the ring, and she's so physical and she's so strong, and you can see when she when you know the the, the right hand out, she throws that massive right hand and she slam jabs. It's not natural strength; it's synthetic strength, and I don't care what the outcome is. I don't care if they said, "Oh no, it was a mistake." It's always a mistake, but she just. It's just more dirty fighters, mate. We got, we know there's a problem in boxing. We know there is a problem, but what do you do? Because everybody's making money. Um, and I like how Eddie Hearn, again, Eddie's spin was great, wasn't it? The PR was, 
you know, you're only seeing more matchroom fighters, and he'd argue that Dillian White wasn't a matchroom fighter. You're only seeing more matchroom fighters testing because we are really pushing this clean testing and we are doing this and we are doing that. Um, I thought that that was that was quite funny that he put a spin on it, which actually said, you know, we're amazing. We're all about clean boxing. No, you're not, mate. You've got a load of fighters in your camp, a load of fighters in your camp who are juicing and they're only boxing twice a year, pal. Right? That's a statement of fact. We know they are, we can't say because it's slander and it probably likely won't ever be proved because a lot of them will get away with it. But you've got dirty fighters with matchroom contracts who are juicing and you are just getting the cycles right more often than not. And the best way to do that is relative inactivity. Uh, what we don't know is how many fighters are serving silent bans and have been inactive now. When I'm not saying that these fighters are serving silent bans and the juicing, but I look at inactive fighters like Spider Richards, Felix Cash, Joe Corina. They're all from the Tony Sims gym, aren't they? They're very inactive for very talented fighters. One of them gave up a world title, Corina. Well, what, have, what have we learned now? We have learned through this whole Conor Ben debacle that sometimes certain things, there's, there's, there's writs served on people. NDAs or whatever, breaches of confidentiality. We know that Matchroom have been very, very keen on this lately, haven't we? Because they've done it with Conor Ben. There's certain things that they said, you do not publish this and you do not publish that. We yeah. haven't really got details of the hearing with Conor Ben. We haven't had any real details, which is why there's elements of speculation. And this is because we called it, didn't we? That, you know, cease and desist. These orders that match them are very good, I believe, allegedly, at slapping on people. So I think there are people, fighters out there, as you've just said, serving silent bans because, you know, it depends when you've done the test, what due restriction you have, was it in competition? Oh, Paul, there's the forum. Yeah. So it's it's dirty. And you've got unbeaten kids who are really good fighters and coming through and they're on the cusp of fighting for big titles and you, you have them inactive and you're putting dross on your show. Why are these fighters inactive? Well, we don't know, do we? I'm not saying that Craig Richards... No, no, you're not... Saying, no, 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 no. I'm just saying they're inactive, so do we need to look at the management, the promoter? Are they injured? Are they lazy? Are they training? Do they want to fight? Or are they on the gear and serving a silent man? It's got to be one of them, hasn't it? One of them eight things. Well, you've not said one particular, one specific name is doing something you shouldn't. You just we're just asking questions, aren't we? We're, we're asking questions because we have a major problem in boxing with yeah. drug cheats, and we know that we have a major problem. And there are certain trends and certain patterns with certain gyms, and it might not be talking about the gym you just mentioned, but we do know there are certain patterns and trends in gyms. And we know, and as I said to you before, there was always a couple of gyms who, when I was working with various trainers and managers, a couple of gyms you'd just be a little bit suspicious about. But testing also, as we know, is massively expensive, isn't it? Yeah. You know, you, you can have a big, high-profile eliminator for a title, but like, there might not any be, be any testing. I mean, mm. you know... I. Sykes will only ever tested for British title fights clean six times out of six. I'll just get in there. Um, very clean. Very clean. Um, but there's a lot of fighters getting away with it. But also the thing is that these fighters are worth so much money and they've got so much sponsorship. It's probably worth their while to have a camp doctor as well, isn't it? To have an advisor if they oh, are taking something. I like Dr. Usman. Um, yeah, yeah, maybe, maybe the old doctor because he's a he's an advisor, isn't it? Because it's the easiest thing in the world is to um, you know cheat a, cheat a peds test, according to Doctor Sajid Usman, um, who happened to work with Conor Ben, allegedly. Yeah, it's it's filthy, mate. It's 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 dirty, and it's just it's such a shame because there are clean fighters out there. There are good. Clean fighters out there, you know. I'm not going to reel them off because they're just. There are loads and loads of clean fighters who you just know. I'll give you an example. You just know someone like a 
and Natasha Jonas is just a hard worker, don't you? Yeah. Just a hard worker, clean life, clean person. 